Yeah. Thank you very much, Amos. So firstly, I'd like to appreciate Amos and his staff to give me such a good opportunity to present my research. I really enjoy meeting some symposium and visiting this area. Actually, this is my first visit to, uh, for Lawrence. And in my presentation, I'm going to talk about the cellular establishment in sarcoma research. As, as he said, my specialty is cancer proteomics. And I'm still learning, uh, investigating cancer proteome. The reason why I needed to establish the cell lines in this field is quite interesting mm -hmm. and will be relevant to your study. Uh, in this century, uh, cancer cell lines uh, it has been increasing, uh, the importance of cancer cell lines has been increasing year by year because of two reasons. So firstly, owing to the technology development, we can easily obtain the data of proteomics or transcriptomes of the patient. And by integrating those global data with the clinical pathological data, we can create many hypotheses. And to prove that hypothesis, we, re we require the patient-derived cancer models, such as cell lines. This is the first reason. And the second reason why we need the cancer cell line is that in this century, we have more anti-cancer drugs. In the previous century, we had a very limited number of anti-cancer drugs. For example, when I was a medical student, we had just 10 or 20 anti-cancer drugs. So we didn't have to learn so many about the chemotherapy. But in this century, we have several hundred anti-cancer drugs, mostly molecular targeting drugs. And we are expecting to predict the response to treatment by examining the mutational status of druggable genes. However, the prediction is not always perfect. And we have to establish a correlation between the mutation status and response to treatment. And the best way is the clinical trials. But the clinical trials are always difficult to perform. So we need some cancer models, such as cell lines. For these two reasons, the importance of cancer cell lines has been increasing year by year in this, in this century. So in my talk, I'm going to talk about the cell line establishment of sarcomas. Um, you may think that cell lines are easily available from the public cell banks, but it's not so true, especially in the field of rare cancers. And I think many of you already know something about rare cancers, so I just confirm the concept of rare cancers. So rare cancers are defined according to the extremely low incidence of the patients. When the number of the, the patient, uh, number of the people who newly diagnosed as certain malignancy is less than six per 100,000 per year, we call that malignancies as rare cancers. So this definition is quite unique because usually malignancies are defined according to the original organs or the original or, or, or molecular background. But in the case of rare cancers, they are defined according to the number of the patient. So because of this definition, many malignancies are classified into this category. According to the definition of rare cancer net, we have 198 different malignancies in this category. You can see that we have a lot of different type of malignancies in this field. And because they are defined just as the number of the patient, they do not have any common molecular background. And all rare cancers behave differently. So the, the study of rare cancer is quite complex. And this slide demonstrates the demonstration of malignancies. So the x-axis, I, I plot the, the malignancies, and the y-axis, I plot the, the incidence of the individual malignancies. You can see that there are a small number of malignancies with a lot of, lot of patients. And we can also have many, many malignancies with a small number of the patients. So in the case of rare cancer, although the number of the individual rare cancer is very small, because we have so many different rare cancers, rare cancers are not so rare. According to the statistical uh, study uh, in Asian countries or European countries, approximately 20% of the cancer patients suffer from rare cancers. So rare cancers are not rare. And the study of rare cancer is quite important to improve the uh, health welfare of our society. Then also the total number of the patients with rare cancer is not so small. Because the number of individual rare cancer is very small, 
the prognosis of the patients in this field is quite poor because the treatment for individual rare cancers is quite limited. This slide demonstrates the prognosis of the rare cancer patients and common cancer patients. You can see that after diagnosis, at any point, like one year, three year, five year, always survival rate is shorter in rare cancers than that in common cancers. Then, according to the statistical study in the United States and Europe, 25% of all cancer, uh, the, um, the 20 percent of all cancer uh, deaths is uh, uh, responsive to the rare cancers. And uh, making a diagnosis is very difficult in the case of rare cancers. Because of the small number of the patients, pathologists cannot have the experience about, ma about making a diagnosis of rare cancers. In this study, the pathologist in the central hospital distributed the pathological slides of rare cancers to the pathologist in the uh, community hospitals. Then, then try to see how they can make a uh, correct diagnosis for the rare cancer patients. And you can see that in 43% of cases, the pathologist in the local hospital uh, made wrong diagnosis. So based on the wrong diagnosis, the doctors cannot achieve the best treatment for the patient. And uh, clinical trials are especially difficult to conduct in rare cancers. And uh, as you know, the clinical trials cost a lot of time and effort and money. And the, uh, and the market for the rare cancer patient is quite small. So the pharmaceutical companies hesitate to make a drug for the rare cancer patient. The good example is that in Japan, we have 100,000 new patients with lung cancers every year. And in contrast, about osteosarcoma, we have only 300 every year. And in the case of Ewing sarcoma, we have just 40 patients annually. So if the drug company develops the drugs for those patients, they cannot recover the investment. So the drugs for the lung cancer patients are quite limited. In Japan, currently, we have more than 100 anti-cancer drugs approved for the treatment. And this slide demonstrates how drastically we became to have new anti-cancer drugs in this century. In the last century, as you can see, the number of the anti-cancer drugs was quite limited. But we still use many of them. And in this century, we have so many anti-cancer drugs, and mostly they are uh, developed for the major cancers, like lung cancers, or colorectal cancers, or liver cancers. The, the uh, molecular drugs uh, written by these red characters are developed for sarcomas, only two. As, as, and then I will talk about sarcomas, and the sarcomas have more than 100 different subtypes with the different clinical behaviors, but only two drugs were developed in the last 20 years. Then, as I said, uh, rare cancers consist of many different types of malignancies, and this slide demonstrates the localization of rare cancers. And among them, I have been focusing on this category, uh, the malignancies from connective tissues, namely sarcomas. It is just because of my personal communication. In the last 20 years, I have many medical doctors for sarcomas in my laboratory, so I continue the study of sarcoma proteomics in my laboratory. Then I'm talking about sarcomas overview. So sarcomas are quite a challenging malignancy because of diversity, complexity, and reality. So sarcomas derived from the connective mesenchymal, mesenchymal tissues, like bones, lipids, and connective tissue. So meaning that sarcomas can occur almost everywhere in human body. So the medical doctors in the different field see the patient with sarcomas. And, sarc and reflecting the original tissues, sarcomas has many, many, uh, many different histological subtypes, like more than 100. And the, this classification has been changing, and uh, I will talk about that later. And also, sarcoma occurs almost everywhere in human body and consists of more than 100 different historic subtypes. The total number of the patients with sarcomas is quite small. In Japan, approximately 3,500 
patients, uh, 300 to 500 people are newly diagnosed as sarcomas annually. Then uh, to see the molecular background of this disease and to develop the biomarkers for the therapeutic strategies, I have been conducting protonic study in the National Cancer Center. I started to work in the National Cancer Center in 2001, and since then we developed a lot of different uh, uh, proteomics modalities, such as large format 2D dyes and reverse phase protein array and mass spectrometry. And I will show you some example about the result of protonic study for sarcomas. So firstly, we try to see if we can classify the sarcomas using proteome data. And it was almost 20 years ago, and we had very nice results. Using the proteome data, we can classify the sarcomas. So using the uh, hierarchical clustering analysis, uh, we found that sarcomas are naturally um, classified according to their protein background, and that classification was almost close to the historical classification. So obviously, proteome data reflect the histological appearance of sarcomas. Then for the next step, we try to develop the biomarkers to predict the response to the neoadjuvant treatment. In the case of osteosarcoma, medical doctors always treat the patient with chemotherapy before the surgical operation. And when the patient responds to the chemotherapy well, the prognosis is very nice. Actually, five-year survival rate exceeds 70%. But if they do not respond to the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, their prognosis is quite poor. And doctors cannot predict the response to the neoadjuvant. So all patients receive the chemotherapy before a surgical operation. And many patients with osteosarcoma are children. And the children suffer from the side effect after the treatment. So we try to avoid the unnecessary uh, chemotherapy by developing the predictive biomarker. So in this study, we obtained the, uh, the uh, biopsy specimen for the patient before chemotherapy, and we conducted the proteomic study and found the proteins which are through the expression level are highly associated with the response to the adjuvant treatment. So we validated this result using the additional cases by Western blotting and in his chemistry. And this is a, a one of the results of the validation study. So this patient shows overexpression of peroxide reduction too, and we expected the poor response to the treatment. But we cannot change the protocol because this is standard chemotherapy. And according to our expect uh, uh, prediction, the, the patient didn't respond well to the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this patient had a larger tumor after the treatment. So this is one of the, the examples of the predictive biomarker in sarcomas. And in this case, we tried to develop a prognostic biomarker in Ewing sarcomas. So in this case, we used the surgical specimens for the proteomic study and found that the nucleohosamine was highly correlated with the prognosis of the patient. When the patient didn't show nucleohosamine positive, or positive uh, when, patient, uh, when the patient had nucleohosamine negative tumor, their prognosis was quite high, quite nice. Instead, if they had positive, uh, their prognosis is quite poor. So this is a very nice example of the prognostic biomarker in Ewing sarcoma. And we also try to develop the prognostic biomarker in gastrointestinal stroma tumor. And uh, I, I just omit the detail, but uh, the validation study was very successful. We examined uh, more than 700 cases in the seven different hospitals for the validation purpose. And immunohistochemistry really is a high correlation between the expression of fetching and the prognosis of the patient with this tumor. Then this is just an ordinary course of proteomic study. I mean, using biomarker resources, we achieve the proteomic study, and we try to identify the proteins by which we can predict the clinical behavior of the patients. And after that, we are always required to perform the functional validation study. And in this, in this, at this step, we need the cell lines. Then I always encounter difficulty to find adequate cell lines for the validation purpose. So empirically, I know that we need more sarcoma cell lines. 
So I, I investigated the contents of cell bank, public cell banks by, by, uh, by hand, manually. Then I found cellosaurus at that time. So it was uh, almost five years ago. So I retrieved the information from the cell house and achieved the meta-analysis. How many sarcoma cell lines are available from the cell banks? So this uh, work was quite difficult because the name of, sar name of sarcoma is very variable because the diagnostic criteria has been changing in the last 20 years. Especially when we became to have the molecular data, the classification has drastically changed in every three or four years. So we used the criteria, with, uh, criteria by WHO at that time, then try to see how many sarcoma cell lines are available. So during this step, we omitted the duplicate cell lines. For example, some cell lines appeared in cell cells repeatedly because those cell lines are transfected with many genes. So we unite those cell lines in a single one. So this is a summary of our results. So as a total, uh, you, you can have the sarcoma with this number. So cell lines with publications, the number of those sarcoma 571 plus 108, and the cell lines in the available from cell banks is 108 plus 36. So this 108, 108 sarcoma cell lines can be used for the research. For, for sarcomas. You may think that 108 was a huge number. Actually, it's not, because we have more than 100 historically different sarcomas, which shows a different clinical behaviors. And uh, limited number of sarcomas are repeatedly uh, subjected for the cell lines. So this is a summary of the histological classification of the cell lines and how many cell lines are established for each sarcoma. And you can see that the top three sarcomas, we have so many uh, cell lines, like osteosarcoma, labdomyosarcoma, and Ewing sarcomas. And other cell lines, we have just several. And the sarcomas, out of the, this list, uh, they, didn't, they didn't have any cell lines. So when we investigate those sarcomas, we always encounter difficulty for the functional study. And uh, I don't know why these three sarcomas, uh, we have so many cell lines. So one key is that these three sarcomas are children's sarcomas. So I think pediatricians focus on the establishment of the cell lines, or the cells from children can be easily established for cell lines. So anyway, so we have so many sarcomas, but we just 108 in cell banks and publication. So definitely we need more cell lines at that time, or even now. Then, uh, I, at that time, I found that we have a vicious cycle in the, the rare cancer study. Because we cannot have enough clinical materials for the research, we do not have cancer models. And without having cancer models, we cannot conduct any experiments in the laboratory. So uh, we cannot expect a good research outcome, and nobody invests, uh, you know, well, nobody gives us research fund. Then nobody creates new cancer model. So we have to change this situation. So if we start to establish new patient-derived cancer models, we can change this situation. Once we have nice cancer models, more number of people will study real cancers, then we can expect more investment in this field. Then somebody will create new cancer models. With this idea, I started to establish cell lines of rare cancers. It was 2012. Before that, I asked the researcher to give me cell lines. So I sent email repeatedly, and I got no response. So I decided to make uh, cell lines by myself. So since then, almost every week, I receive the tumor tissue sample from the hospitals and try to establish cell lines or xenografts. And at the same time, I also do some proteomics or genomic study for the established cancer models. So this is a list of the cell lines um, established in my laboratory. At the beginning, we couldn't establish cell lines at all. Actually, I had no experience about primary tissue culture even now, so we had a very difficult time. But uh, we, uh, we uh, improved the research conditions. I hired the good people for the cell line establishment. And uh, recently, we can establish so many cell lines annually. And uh, 
Then uh, we have the list in the cell cells with the name of NCC sarcoma cell line panel. Then, uh, then by using the established cell lines, we are now currently conducting so-called pharmacoproteogenomic study. So in the pharmacoproteogenomic study, by using a patient-derived cancer model, we screen the drug for the anti-tumor effects. And at the same time, using the cancer model, we also examine the molecular background as a proteome and genomic level. And by combining these results, we can identify novel anti-cancer drugs as well as the predictive biomarkers. So I purchased the molecular targeting drug, which were approved by FDA, as many as possible, and examine the anti-tumor effects by using the established cell rights. At the same time, I also investigate the mutational status of druggable genes by using the technique of next-generation sequencing, or SNP array. And I can see that several mutations which could be druggable in the different type of malignancies, and I also confirm amplification, which are already reported in certain sarcomas. Then I, I, then I combine the results of drug screening and the proteogenomic study. And unfortunately, the sarcomas with a drug, so-called drug mutation didn't respond to the corresponding molecular targeting drug. So, but the, these results are quite concordant with the clinical observations. For example, EGF receptor mutations are often observed in osteosarcomas. But osteosarcomas never respond to imatinib. Or uh, we can say the same thing for the other combinations. For, for example, BRAF mutations are also observed in many sarcomas, but they are not response to the molecular targeting drugs. So we can establish the combination between the genetic mutation and response to the molecular targeting drug by using cell line in high throughput way. Then once we have some nice concordance, we can go to the clinical study. Then in the clinical, uh, in the drug screening, uh, we usually we screen more than 200 anti-cancer drugs approved by the FDA. Then uh, we found certain drugs shows very nice anti-tumor effects for many, for many of the established cell rights. And we are now confirming this result using the genograft, patient-derived genograft. So uh, this is a list of the histology for which we, uh, we could establish cell rights. So some, some, I always have some questions. So what is the factors for the success, successful cell line establishment? But currently, I don't have any answer to that question. For example, uh, for certain sarcomas, we repeatedly establish the cell rights. For example, giant cell tumor bone. But giant cell tumor bone is not so malignant. Usually, this tumor do not uh, make a distant metastasis, and the prognosis of the patient is quite nice. But instead, malignant peripheral nerve cyst tumor, this is very malignant sarcomas. Then uh, the other one, uh, yeah, so I mean the malignant, malignant potential in, in vivo does not determine the success rate of cellular establishment. So I need to continue this study. So I will retire in five years from National Cancer Center, but definitely I cannot complete this project. I have more than 100 sarcomas for cellular establishment. So I hope my students or my staff continue my project after five years. Then, in addition to sarcomas, we have so many rare cancers. So, but I prove that it's not so difficult to establish cellular of rare cancers. So I hope to expand this study by somebody and to have more cell lines for rare cancers, because we may have a similar situation in all rare cancers. And we also have the different, uh, similar situation in, even in common cancer. So this slide demonstrates the molecular background of lung adenocarcinoma. So lung adenocarcinomas are definitely common cancers, and we have so many cell lines of lung cancer. But when we look into the molecular background of those cell lines, definitely we need to have more, than, more cell lines. You can see that the molecular background are quite complex in this tumor, and actually backgrounds are a little bit different between Japan and the United States. The previously, the molecular background didn't so matter at all in the clinical practice, 
But nowadays, because we have molecular targeting drugs, and the medical doctor decides the therapeutic strategy according to the molecular profile, we need the cell lines with a unique combination of genetic profiles. So in that sense, we need more cell lines with the detailed data of genome and proteome. So this is the last slide of my presentation. I hope the cell cells to provide us the information to decide which cell lines we have to establish further. So currently, uh, we uh, definitely we need more cell lines, and the priority should be determined according to the clinical requirement. So I hope cell line, uh, I hope cell cells provides the information about that. Thank you very much for your attention. So time for questions. Thanks for this interesting talk. Uh, I would have a question concerning the proteogenomics approach that you showed. Are you, have you been looking predominantly for mutations, or are you as well looking, for example, for gene fusion or novel transcripts of known oncogenes in this approach? Okay, so we have some gene panel tests. We call that NCC onco panel. In, in NCC onco panel, we examine the drug or mutation for 120 genes, as well as a fusion genes. So we, exam we use NCC onco panel for all established cell lines. In addition to that, we also studied the whole exon sequencing for the cell lines. Yeah, I was wondering if you do the bottom-up approach for prote uh, proteomics, whether you can find as well you know, no, uh, peptides which are unique for certain fusions or so on. Yeah, yeah. actually that is what we are doing. So currently we, we will purchase the newest mass spectrometry in our institute. Mm -hmm. So the newest one will cover almost all proteome in a single experiment. So I hope to combine the proteome data and the genome data to find more drugable mutation or the protein reflecting the mutation status. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the talk. I'm curious about the methodology and the success rate. How, what is the success rate of going from organoid to make a cell line or from a xenograph to make cell line? Do you use the same medium? What are the conditions there? Thank okay, you. So I try to optimize the tissue culture medium, but the tissue culture medium should be optimized according to the histological subtypes. But currently I just have a single type of cell culture. So, which include local inhibitor and several growth factors. And the success rate of cell lines is in, in approximately 25% in average, but it largely depends on the histological subtypes. For example, in the case of giant cell tumor of bone, success rate is close to 100%. But in contrast for angiosarcoma, angiosarcoma is quite malignant sarcomas, but success rate was 0%. So it's difficult to explain this uh, discordance. And uh, all, cells, all the cell lines, we make a spheroid in, in, in the U-shaped uh, uh, 96 square plate. So all the cell lines make, uh, can make a spheroid. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.